You're listening to the AdCast, the podcast for marketers and advertisers with your host, Eric Elliott. All right, welcome back to the AdCast. This is episode two of my interview with Mr. Cara from the Creators Law Firm. She's based out in Charlotte, North Carolina, and she's just an Instagram app away from you being able to contact her. Um, we had some great conversations. We talked about the McDonald's movie, The Founder. We talked about who owns the work. We talked about patents. We even talked about Jennifer Lawrence in the movie Joy. So I can just I can just tell you this episode is going to be filled with a lot here. Um, so, um, Takora, for those who may not have heard episode one or tuned in episode one, would you be so kind to kind of tell the folks a lot about yourself? Of course, of course. I'm attorney Takora Davis. I am the owner of the Creator a boutique intellectual property and business law firm. We serve clients all across the country because we do practice intellectual property law. And I also own Business Bakery, which is a go-to resource for creatives, all things contracts, courses, and biz resources to help you grow and protect your business. Awesome. Now, what is the web address on the Business Bakery? Oh, okay. Well, you can go to uh, tacoradavis.com and uh, it's actually going to to either my firm website or business bakery so we like to just put it in one spot and make it easy for folks so my first name takora t-i-c-o-r-a davis d-a-v-i-s dot com now that is awesome now i want to talk about let's just say like where we are in charleston there are so many creators so many good graphics people so many good video people when you're doing a video for a company, right? Let's just say if a company hires us, just using us for an example, and they ask us to do a video for them, do they own that video? So can they do whatever they want with that video once we've created it for them? Well, I think that will come down to what is in the contract and really the scope of the services that you're providing to them. Um, Again, the general rule when it comes to copyright law is that the owner and the is the creator of the work. So your ad agency would technically own the video, even if you are um, creating it on behalf of a company. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, what some people will do is they will license that video to the company for a limited time. And you can also put restrictions on that. Again, a license is really you saying, hey, I own this piece of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. It could be a patent, it could be a trademark, it could be a copyright. And you're allowing a third party to use it for a limited time and a limited purpose. So um, you can license that to them. And then you can also put restrictions on a license. You can say, listen, you can only post this video on these platforms. You cannot, you know, break the video up because you may, if if the video is from your company, uh, someone else manipulating it will really be a reflection on your work. And that may not be the accuracy of the, 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 product deliverable, wow. right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there are certain things that we can do, um, almost like I kind of liken it to some people don't realize this, but if a police officer pulls you over in your car and they ask to search your car, you can say, yes, you can search my car, but you cannot search the glove compartment of the trunk, <laughs> right? Mm. You can limit the officer's scope of his search. Similarly with intellectual property, we can limit how people can use our own intellectual property, which is kind of like what a license is. Wow. So let's just say like like the we talked about the video. So whenever you do a video, is it smart for you to kind of put like your creative mark on the video? Does that make sense? Does that protect you in any way at all? I think some people like to put a watermark on the video because um, in the event someone does rip the video, you know, and they repost it. Sometimes that watermark can still be visible, so it can be traced back to the can just put something right over that copyright. So it's not always, you know, some people encourage it. Either way, whether you put the watermark there or not, it's not going to change ownership. Mm-hmm. You will still be the owner of a video, whether there's a copyright, excuse me, whether there's a copyright, you know, notice at the end or whether there's a watermark. Wow. So, okay, like, let's just say, because I see a lot of times you'll see, like, the NFL, they're, they're pretty good about it. They'll... If you watch an NFL video, it'll say copyright NFL 2018. And that means, like, you can't chop up their stuff, right? Is that what that means? Like, you can't utilize the NFL video? Uh, say that one more time. So, like, for instance, like, the M- the NFL, a lot of the, the national sporting 
uh, associations like the NFL, NBA, they're very mm-hmm. good at you know letting you know you know you can't use it without our written permission or they'll have like on screen a little copyright in like nba 2019 uh, it what is, what is that for i've seen that on screens before what is that for okay that's just a copyright notice and it's similar to the ones that are pretty much at the bottom of everybody's website right it'll say copyright from this year to this year Mm -hmm. it's really just a notice that's put out there to the public letting them know that hey i'm the owner of this work this is the date that it was copyrighted Mm -hmm. and that's that what's interesting about copyright is that from the moment that you create something a literary or artistic work copyright attaches You don't even have to register it with the U.S. Copyright Office in Mm. order to put that notice there. It is already done from the moment of creation. Now, strategically, I believe that you should register copyrighted works. Why? Because nobody knows that you're the owner. The copyright owned office can pretty much house a record of you being the owner. So in the event someone does infringe on your intellectual property, by utilizing that video without your permission or taking your entire website, like happened to one of my clients. <laughs> she hired wow. me, she said, this company took my entire website. They even took pictures of me um, because she sells some sort of, some fitness, um, you know, fitness apparel and things mm-hmm. like that. And they're basically making it seem like this is my company. So they were not only using her copyright, but mm. her personality rights, her likeness to sell those particular goods. And so we had to take that down. No. So again, uh, so again, you know, that the copyright uh, can be used strategically in terms of registration to prove that you're the owner. And finally, um, based on what the Supreme Court, um, their, their order in April, you have to register your copyright in order to sue in federal court. So the registration has to be complete in order for you to have standing to sue in federal court. So now you just talked about someone using someone else's image. Now, I, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen this on Facebook where where it's like a hot topic. They're like, don't put pictures of your kids because now Facebook owns the image whenever you put a picture of your kid up there. So how, how does that work? So we can we dispel that rumor about like when you post something on Facebook, do they now own your picture and can they do with it whatever they want? Right. So um, here's the thing. Whenever, if you look within Facebook or Instagram's terms of service, it does not say that they own your intellectual property. In fact, it explicitly states that they do not own your intellectual property. What we do provide to Facebook is a limited license by way of their user agreement that says you can use the pictures that I upload for commercial purposes. And the way to revoke access is to either delete your entire account or delete those photos. So what we're providing to Facebook by way of the user agreement is that we're allowing them to utilize our likeness for those particular purposes. So no, Facebook does not own the images of your family. You still own the copyright to that, whatever it is that you upload. And also what's nice is that let's say for instance, somebody else is utilizing pictures of your kids. You can utilize Facebook or Instagram's copyright infringement report form. And you can say, listen, somebody else has this picture of my child or a picture of myself uh, on their personal page. Mm -hmm. And so this is an infringement of the copyright and Facebook will remove it. Wow, I, I think there's so many people that they have no idea, especially like Instagram is just an app of pictures is really what it is, pictures and video, yeah. and they're uploading things and they have no idea, like the minute that they accept those terms and conditions that they're saying, hey, you can use my stuff whenever you want. So they have no idea. Right. So read your fine print, people. Read your fine print. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Wh- wh- I think we saw that in that face app where it was making people old. And people were like, oh, my gosh, it's like a Russian company. And yeah. now it says all this stuff. Those things. Yeah, I, I had someone say the Russians have your information now, Eric. <laughs> so quick question now. Um, what about when you, let's just say if you're providing a service for, for someone else, right? Um, and you're doing that, can they utilize your work to say it's their own? If you are providing a service for someone else, can I get an example? Yeah. Meaning like... So here's uh, here's an example. Um, Let's just say if you are a production company, right? But you outsource your production, right? So you really don't have the production capability, and then I'm doing the production for you, right? So then you have your website 
and you're showing all the work that your company does, but we're doing right. it. Is that legal? Mm -hmm. Is that legal? Um, I think that, again, that that should go back to what's in the agreement. Mm -hmm. And I know I keep saying that, but you should definitely make it very clear that, you know, this is a service that we're providing. Um, maybe within the client's rights and responsibilities, you cannot, you need to give accreditation to us for this particular work. If you're going to post it on the website, you cannot Got make it. it seem as if this is work that you do. So sometimes just simply saying, hey, because um, I've seen in photographers agreements, they say, if you're going to post my work on Instagram, do not filter it. Do not crop it. Right. Because they're saying that you're going to distort the quality of the work that I've done. And people are going to assume that that is, you know, my my work level. Right. And that's like the outcomes that you'll get. And they may not say that's an accurate reflection of what they do. Similarly, with you all or anyone, listen, say, listen, if you are going to put our work and it could be a misconception or it could be misconstrued that you're the one who did this. What we will request is for clarity on that or an accreditation. And so that's something that you can put within your terms of agreement. Because if there's, if you feel like there's some confusion, most likely other people will as well. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure that people understand like, hey, we're the people who actually did this. Well, what I want to do is I want to encourage people to go to your website and also look up the business bakery because what it keeps coming back to is the agreement that's what it keeps yeah. coming back to i we're gonna Definitely. go we're gonna go to break but i want you to kind of say that website address one more time if you could for me of course if you go to my website takora davis.com that is spelled t-i-c-o-r-a d-a-v-i-s dot com you will not only get access to business bakery and it'll say you know you can click get contracts and courses that'll take you to business bakery but if you say oh i just need legal services like get a trademark it'll take you to the firm's website all right definitely so creative stop going to legal zoom uh this is stop. nothing no, this is nothing against legal zoom but you know this is someone who actually handles trademark and service marks uh, and, and she actually has the tools there for you to be able to utilize them. And I think that's very good because the one thing I know about creatives, are we're so passionate about our work that we yeah. sometimes forget the business end of things or we don't know the value of what we've created, right? Right, So yes. what we're going to do is we're going to take a break. Hopefully someone can get a, a sip of water and they can come back and tune into the rest of the ad cast. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Katy Perry. All right. All right. You don't need a marketing agency. You do deserve very important placement. VIP Marketing and Advertising is a cutting edge strategic digital, creative, media and marketing partner that provides services for businesses of all sizes. To stay up to date on the latest marketing news, subscribe for email updates at veryimportantplacement.com. You're listening to The Adcast, the podcast for marketers and advertisers. All right, so welcome back to The Adcast. I am back online with Mr. Cora Davis. And if you are inside your car and you're listening to this, then also go to YouTube. Go to VIP Marketing One on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. And you can also watch Mr. Cora and I in action right now. She's in Charlotte. I'm in Charleston right now, and we're conducting a, a hefty, hefty, knowledge, knowledgeable podcast on copyright. Um, let's just say this. I've seen people state in, within their state, they have done what you call service marks on something versus, and then they think that they have it trademarked. So can you explain the difference on what's a service mark and what's a trademark? And, and also, um, does it... Are you protected if you only do it within your state? Okay, sure. So um, a trademark in general is a word, phrase, logo. In very rare cases, it can be a scent, it can be a sound, and it can even be a color that is used as a source identifier. Wow. That means that when I experience this trademark, I can figure out who is the business that this emanates from. Got it. So for example, when it comes to colors, think of that magenta pink for phone services, we know that that's T-Mobile or that Brown. Uh, we know it's UPS when it comes to mail delivery services, right? Right. So that's what a trademark is. Um, and so that's the purpose. We pretty much have two kind of different levels. One is a state trademark, and then we also have a federal trademark. The key distinction between the two is that a state trademark only gives you protection in your state. 
um, and a federal trademark gives you protection across the country and the territories. Trademark law is jurisdictional, so that means that you only have protection within the country that you're operating in if you pursue it on a federal level. If you are doing international business and you also have a presence in other other com countries like some of my clients, we will then need to look into avenues for you to also secure your rights across the globe, depending upon the country you're in. Got it. And that was kind of the situation with Supreme and Supreme Italia and things like that, because there were some trademark issues based on the jurisdiction. So um, pretty much when it comes to that, that's the key difference. Now you're asking about the difference between a trademark and a service mark. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest way for me to explain this is how I do on my discovery calls with clients. Back in the day, when I was a little girl, my mother had encyclopedias in the house. And, you know, when you see a, a psych encyclopedia, you go up to volume S and everything within volume S starts with that letter. Similarly, trademarks have volumes or what, I, what we call classes, mm -hmm. but they're numerical. There are 45 different classes that you can register your trademark in. So if I take you to class three and we pull it out, Chris, and I say, listen, class three, that has all the products that are cosmetics and all the products that are like cleaning products. So this is where Dove Soap has their trademark registered, mm. class three. If I walk you down to class 30, Dove Chocolate has their trademark in class 30 because that's where the food items are. So really, this is how one different businesses can have the exact same name but because they offer different services or products, there's no likelihood of confusion. Wow. So we see this with uh, Delta Airlines and Delta Faucets or Pandora Jewelry and Pandora Music. And of course, like I said, Dove Chocolate and Dove Soap. So I say this because I want that to provide the framework when it comes to service marks and trademarks. The first 34 classes, classes 1 through 34, are where goods are so those are trademarks mm -hmm. again a trademark is a mark that you use in connection with your trade which is a business the final 10 classes class uh, 35 through 45 are for services so my trademark for my firm are in class 45 because that's where the legal services are Got it. people typically use the names interchangeably you know i say hey i have a trademark for the creator's law firm it's technically a service mark but people use those terms interchangeably but generally a service mark really just means that you offer services in your business and you have a service mark that's registered um so if you have a state trademark mm -hmm. it's only good within your state um, whether it be a state service mark or a state trademark but many of us just use those words interchangeably wow. Well, so let's just say that someone has the, the, the mark filled out and completed. How are they able to check to see if other people are using their mark? Like, let's just say if, if you're in Charlotte, if I have a, a, a national um, or, or a federal trademark, you're in Charlotte and I'm in Charleston, we're, we're only three and a half hours away from one another. But how would I know if you're using it unless I go out looking to see, like, who, who's using my mark today? Right. So one of the things that we offer through our subscription legal service plan is we offer ongoing trademark monitoring. Mm. So I have for my clients who are in these particular subscription levels, I will set up monitoring services through some proprietary legal software that I license annually and it allows me to monitor those marks. Mm -hmm. Another thing to do if you're like, so Cora, I just don't have the funds to hire you. Mm -hmm. You can set up a Google, Google alert. <laughs> so I love to set up Google <laughs> alerts, but that lets me know, like, when is my company being mentioned in the right. news or anywhere? And so you may be able to catch someone else using your name that way. So that's an easy, free way to do it as well. Another thing is that if you do a quick search on Instagram or social media, sometimes you can catch other people trying yeah. to start businesses with the same name. Mm -hmm. Why? One of the first things that I did when I started my law firm was after I filed my LLC, I put up my Facebook business page. It's just one of the first things that you do, because if you don't have a lot of money, you're like, at least I can use this free platform right. to promote my business. So those are some really some three easy, quick things that you can do that are free. It doesn't take a lot of time to set up, but then you're able to see the lay of the land. Another way, of course, is when people come to me and they want me to do a trademark and file it. Um, so we have on demand legal projects. So if you come to me and say, I'm, I'm ready to get a trademark filed. One of the first things that I do is a comprehensive trademark clearance search. Mm. Of course, you can go on the USPTO's website. 
and you can type in your name to see if it's registered. But there's a huge problem with just doing that alone. If you, the, the system only searches what you tell it to search. And I know that sounds silly, but go with me. If, if you came to me and said, Decora, I want to start a company. It's going to be amazing. It's going to sell coffee and tea and people are going to come there and they're going to do co-working. I'm going to call it Starbucks, but I'm going to spell it S-T-A-R-B-U-X. Right. Mm. I'm like, OK, well, then they go and they search for Starbucks, S-T-A-R-B-U-X. What will happen is it'll say there are no trademarks registered for Starbucks because of the way you spelled it on the USPTO's website. It's not going to capture over the, the one, over 100 trademarks that Starbucks that we all know and most of us love right. has because they were not spelled the same. So what happens a lot of times is that people will say, I filed my own trademark, I did a search. It said that there were no trademarks, but it's like you have to, trademarks are not just for if it's spelled exactly the same. There, it can also get knocked out if they look the same, if they sound the same like phonetically, sonically, mm -hmm. you know, and pronounce the same. And if they're in the same industry, right, or they're providing the same services. So that's one of the major rookie mistakes that people make mm. because they only search that alone. So my software, and I also search, you know, with my own hands, <laughs> is that it's able to pull not only all those particular registrations, it will take into consideration, are these similar, do they sound similar? Are they pronounced similarly? Do they even look the same? Are the products being sold in the same category or class? And so we have to look at that from a, you know, a comprehensive standpoint and then figure out if you pursue this trademark and file it, are we putting a target on your back? Wow. People are very, very, as we all should be, the number one thing that people know about your business is most likely your name. That's how they find you. You know, if it says, where did you get this item from? Who did your graphic design? I'm going to tell them the business name first. Yes, and then the individual. That, right, and then the individual. And so what? You're going to go and look for it. So if there are tons of other businesses that have a similar name as yours, mm -hmm. then you know that could be potentially confusing for a prospective client. So again, if you are pursuing trademark protection and you have not done a comprehensive search, these companies who are out here who do have federal trademarks or they have been using their names longer, they're going to protect their brand vigorously because it's ultimately affecting their bottom line. 100%. What, I love about, what I love about trademarks is that they can last forever, unlike a patent and unlike a copyright. Patents have a lifespan of 20 years, most of them, um, technically 21 if you want to count that provisional um, year. Um, and copyrights last for the life of the person now plus 75 years. Trademarks can last in perpetuity, meaning forever, as long as they are in use. So this is that one piece of intellectual property that can stick around as long as, as the company is up and moving. right? So of course these businesses are going to protect their name because the rights never run out. It's intellectual property. You can pass it along in a will if you want, right? Because you can pass along a home, that's real property. You can pass upon a car, that's personal property. You can also bequeath intellectual property. And people don't look up at intellectual property that way because it's not something we can always touch. It's not something that's always tangible. And the things that we touch in this world, we ascribe this huge value to, but oftentimes the intellectual property Again, it's the most valuable business asset you can own. And if you think of what you all do, the content that you create on behalf of your clients, that's the bulk, that's the heart wow. of the work. It, yeah. You know, that is the heart and the crux of, of what's going on here. And many times intellectual property, your portfolio will account for 40 to 80% of your business's value. It's not the nice chairs that you're sitting in or the swanky office, right? It is the actual work that you do and the transformation that you provide to change your clients' lives. Wow, that that is that is something. That is a, really a, a dark horse. <laughs> That's a dark horse, which leads me to uh, the, our our final topic. Um, uh, you know, Katy Perry, very popular musician, um, recently lost a battle in court uh, for I think copyright infringement, trademark infringement, where mm -hmm. the song that she had, uh, "Dark Horse." Um, there were some other uh, 
musicians, I think Flame and, and I can't remember the name of the other one. Okay. Um, yeah. they, they were actually uh, kind of gospel singers uh, or, or, or hip-hop gospel um, singers, yeah. and they won their battle against that. And, and we've seen this happen so much. I mean, you saw it with uh, Robin Thicke in, in the Marvin Gaye estate, you know. But l- let's talk about this with the, the Katy Perry thing. I mean, she lost. I mean, how does that work when it comes to music? I mean, because it, it could be the simplest sound, like you said earlier about, you know, trademark could be a sound. So how does this work? How does this work? And, and how did someone like Katy Perry lose this argument? Okay, so um, this battle, I think, has been going on for the past four to five, four to five years. Um, from my understanding, I believe in 2007 or 2006, um, Flame and Lecrae re- released the song Joyful Noise. Okay. And about five years later, in 2013, Katy Perry um, released Dark Horse. And so Flame and Lecrae's song was actually nominated for a Grammy. It has a sick beat if you really listen to it. Wow. And so that's really, um, you know, copyright applies to uh, not only music lyrics, but also the actual song itself and the composition of the song. So that is where the intellectual property comes into play. Okay. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes if you have a very catchy beat, um, like Flame and Lecrae did, it's extremely noticeable. And so for the moment that Dark Horse was released, um, I remember reading comments and people were like, this is joyful noise. Like, this is this is the, this is their beat. You know, this is what this is. And so that had been going on for a while. Mm-hmm. So essentially, if another artist takes a beat <laughs> um, and whether they speed it up or slow it down, still, that is the original artist's work. Got it's it. a derivative work basically a derivative work that someone created. It would be the equivalent of someone taking a video that you um, take, you know, made for them and slowing it up or speeding it, um, slowing it down or speeding it up, right? You still own that derivative work. So similarly, that's what has been alleged to happen here. Um, Flame and Lecrae had this song. There was a very um, iconic, I would, I would even say beat. And what happened was it's been, you know, they said that Katy Perry and her team took that beat um, or the producer took the beat and then she was able to write the song over top of it. And so she did that without asking for their permission, um, you know, and also without paying them. And so this was a huge hit. Wow. And so, um, so basically what had to happen was, you know, there was a lawsuit. Most likely there probably was some letters that went back and forth like, hey, that's our stuff. Yeah. That's our stuff. You can remit payment. Let's try to settle. And maybe settlement broke down and then they proceeded with the lawsuit. And mm. then they have a musicologist that comes in and they kind of compare the songs and they talk about the similarities and things like that. And so then a jury, a civil jury sat there and they listened and then they decided, yes, you know, this wow. is infringement or it's not. And so that's what had to happen here. And so after you have a lawsuit that's decided in the favor of one defendant over the other here, it was decided in favor of flame. They then proceeded to settlement uh, discussions. And so the jury then has to look at the statutes and say, okay, based on maybe, you know, flame says, Hey, my reputation as a Christian in a gospel rapper has been compromised because people are assuming that, you know, I gave you access to this, wow. you know, they associate, they associate wow. my song now with your song. Right. And so, you know, and that, that has a legitimate argument there. And so he's saying he suffered re- damage to his reputation. Um, he also missed out on all of those payments from royalties. So the jury came back recently and they uh, awarded him with $2.7 million for the infringement. So, you know, most likely, uh, he either registered a copyright to the song <laughs> or wow. he did that shortly after. And so he was able to, I believe that this was in federal court. And so that's pretty much how it will come to play when it comes to some of this stuff. And and the thing about the the beauty of it is, you know, you, we see this happen on smaller scales. Like I remember um, for Netflix and Stranger Things, there was a guy who had a blog and he would t- put pictures of his VCRs on on his blog and so the actual company the design company that did the stranger things um cover which is a vcr they took his photo and they manipulated it and they put stranger things on top and then he realized like wait a minute this is 
<laughs> this is my photo. Wow. And so he ended up he ended up writing a blog about it and it caught the attention of Netflix. And he later said, me and Netflix have negotiated and I'm very happy with the settlement. I can't discuss it. And so they probably cut him a nice check. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, I don't know if he, you know, had a copyright to that photo, but he certainly was well within his rights to request that either they remove it or they pay him for it. Correct. And so we just never know as small business owners, this guy has a blog, he's doing something that he loves. He wasn't thinking that Netflix was going to come along. Right. And I think that that's, that's, we need to just position ourselves to just be ready because you never know what's going to happen. You never know the big companies who are going to come around. Like for instance, I had a young lady reach out to me and she, um, create stationary. Um, she did not move forward with my services, but she said, you know, this huge card company, not going to say their name. They're in, when you think of cards, you think of them. They just filed a trademark for her exact business name. She did not have her federal trademark filed. So I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, if you had filed that trademark, and she still probably could reach out to them, but it without that federal trademark, I don't want to say her hands are tied, but she has nothing. you know, when you get, yeah, she she really can't say, oh well, you can't or you can't. They could have just whew, the licensing deal that could have happened, you know, would have been amazing for her and possibly life changing. And so now she was in this position of, what do I do? You know, and I hate when people get in that situation. That's why I created Business Bakery, because if you are a small business owner and you cannot afford to hire an attorney, we have a, a, a affordable monthly payment for you to be in this program that can teach you how to do these things yourselves, you know, as opposed to just sitting back and saying, oh, well, I'll worry about it later. And well, when later comes, most of the time you're in distress. <laughs> that, that is something. I, I, I mean, what a jam packed episode. That we have and you are just a wealth of information um i want to thank our listeners for giving us their most valuable asset their time and listening to you and i today uh and i want to also encourage them to go to your website go ahead and give them that website address again it is takora davis.com t-i-c-o-r-a d-a-v-i-s.com awesome so visit takora ask the questions, look at the agreements. And like my wise client said to me, if you wait until you're ready, it is too late. Some people don't <laughs> want to call an attorney or get you know someone to look at their documents or agreements, uh, especially us creatives, until it's too late. So do, yeah. do yourself uh, some service and do it ahead of time. Uh, but we want to thank you guys for listening and watching the AdCast. Uh, remember to follow us on Facebook, Instagram. We want to thank Craft Creative for actually uh, providing production for us today. Thank you to our guest, Mr. Corey Davis. Uh, and also log on to our website, veryimportantplacement.com, for any tips, updates, and also uh, subscribe to us, and, and you'll get our updates as well. So we want to thank you. We'd love to earn a five-star rating from you. This is the AdCast. Copyright VIP Marketing and Advertising. Produced by Craft Creative. When all eyes are on you, make it count. From audio to video to graphic design and more, Craft Creative can do it all. We don't make commercials. We craft creative. See what we can do for you at wecraftcreative.com.